Thank you, Lucas, for joining me on the podcast today. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, you are the founder and CEO of Pods Media. Uh, you guys are doing podcast NFTs, something I've been interested in for a long time now. Um, I know you know people have seen about NFTs in the realm of art or uh, you know profile pictures, things like that. And for those who aren't as familiar with crypto, you know, bear with us. Maybe there will be parts of this conversation that will make more sense, but we're going to kind of speak as if it's a a crypto native audience. Um, so I've been interested in podcasts as sort of a type of NFT for a long time. It makes a lot of sense in the spectrum of of other media. And here you are building a platform to enable just that. So uh, excited to do this and excited to, you know, mint this podcast episode as uh, my first on the platform for Pod of Jake. So I think we've got a pretty cool thing lined up here. But before we dig into too much of anything, uh, it would be great to kind of get your story from as early as you're willing to start to, you know, what you're doing today and, and talking through some of the decisions you made along the way. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thank you so much for for having me on the podcast. It's uh, it's great to, to get involved here um, and obviously great to get this on chain. So yeah, in terms of my background, um, I had always been really interested in money and finance, was studying economics at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, and had just been in and out of crypto a couple times throughout high school and uh, college had kind of like downloaded the early missed wallets had experimented with crypto but you know for the most part it just wasn't all the way there for me or I would get lost somewhere um, and then kind of going in closing out of my junior year heading into my senior year I really fell down the crypto rabbit hole and was kind of at this um, intersection of okay I can either go into you know, traditional finance, go work at Fidelity or some shit like that, or um, really risk it for the biscuit and go all in on this crypto stuff, something I was really passionate about, something I was really interested in, and uh, decided to uh, go for it and go get involved in crypto and try to just start getting involved in wherever places I can. One of the first things I did was join the CU Blockchain Club, um, and I met my good friend uh, Cooper Turley there, Koopa Troopa, um, and we went on this journey together for a few years, kind of just trying to get our foot in the door in the crypto industry. Um, and really where we started to find our niche was on the media side. Um, so we were doing a lot of writing, uh, running a newsletter called Token Tuesdays. We had spun up a blog called DeFi Rate um, in early 2019, really covering the emergence of decentralized finance um, and just writing and producing as much media as possible. Um, and then from there, Ryan Sean Adams was actually following a lot of my work and offered me a job at Bankless, um, where I was fortunate to join the team as the first employee there. Um, so I led the Bankless newsletter for about three years, really helped scale that media company to, you know, an audience. When I joined, I think it was, you know, subscribers were like sub 10,000. Um, and by the time I left, it was over 300,000. So really got to see the explosiveness in that growth. And um, where pod slots in is, Okay, so I was really involved on the media side of stuff, whether it was it was through DeFi, right? Whether it was through Bankless, um, or you know any of the side newsletters that I had started, and I really kind of went down this rabbit hole of like, look, we're sitting here all day, every day, talking about you know the power of this technology, the power of crypto, and here we are, kind of sitting here, just running the same playbook for media as Web two. We're running sponsorships, we're doing paid subscriptions. You know, there's really nothing innovative here, and the way that I point put it is is like every crypto media you know company or any sort of producer in 2019 2020 21 22 up until like pretty much the past year is really just talking the talk of crypto right um they're just talking about this all day every day um but really we need to be getting to the point where we can walk the walk and actually leverage this technology to rethink the media business model and how to engage and how to earn from media media and monetize on that front so i really went down this rabbit hole in 2021 of like how do you build a web3 media company or what is media what is the business model for media look like in the lens of crypto or on chain or web three, right? Um, and one of the big things that I came up with or just realized was like all of the content should be on chain and mintable and ownable by the community. Um, among other things, I think there's plenty of other, you know, cool avenues, but I think content being on chain is probably like the foundation for, you know, the future of media um, in the lens of, of crypto. So I had really tried to push this idea of like, okay, let's publish all of our content on chain. Um, I was still at Bankless at the time. Ryan and David were like, nah, like no one would ever do that. Um, it would, you know, 
and rightfully so, you know, no one was really thinking about this, putting media on chain, you know, most of the NFT activity at the time was, you know, PFPs and, and generative art and all that kind of stuff. Um, and where it really kind of turned around was in, you know, 2022 music NFTs were really having kind of a moment, um, you know, mid a bear market people, you know, mint activity was all time highs. And I was like, okay, Brian, David, a podcast NFT is the exact same thing as a music NFT, right? It's the only difference is uh, one is three to five minutes long. The other one is an hour long, two hours long, right? But at the end of the day, it's a thumbnail and an audio file. Um, and music NFTs are really seeing a lot of momentum off of this format. So I think we should try and do, you know, a podcast NFT and see what that looks like. So we had spun up Bankless Collectibles. I had duct taped together a quick... Uh, you know, tech stack for the team to use using sound protocol and bonfire. Um, and we tested out the concept, released about 20 episodes on chain as collectible NFTs. And uh, it did really well. I think the first five episodes, you know, we released over five weeks in total. It took less than two minutes cumulatively. Um, you know, I think it was 10 Ethereum blocks or something like that, cumulatively across all five weeks for all of the episodes to sell out. And we really just saw, okay, maybe that there is something here. Um, the problem was, is that the tech stack that we had generalized didn't really scale, right? Uh, we were on ETH mainnet, we were using bonfire for discovery and listening, like it just wasn't really it. So I was kind of at this intersection of like, okay, there's a lot of interest from collectors, a lot of interest from creators. There's something here around on-chain content that I've been a believer in for a few years now. Let me take a step back and see if I can generalize this tech stack for every podcast creator. Um, so I had left Bankless back in May. So a uh, little bit less than a year ago, or yeah, a little bit less than a year ago. Um, and went on the venture to build pods and build this native platform for podcasts to publish on chain to open up a new monetization and analytics model for creators. And we could kind of talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I will pause there since I just went on a long monologue. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I appreciate the story. And it definitely uh, makes sense as to how you've landed where you have and, and building this uh, platform for podcasts to go on chain. Um, when you left Bankless, like a little less than a year ago, did you know, you know, this is what you were going to go build? Did you leave to build this? Or did you leave and then yeah. independently come upon the conclusion to to go build this? Yeah, so I had kind of uh, put together some V0 tooling while I was still at Bankless, just kind of you know, helping them publish some of the episodes that we were releasing on chain um, and then just saw this opportunity to generalize it. So I left in May uh, to pursue pods full time and really build this out um, just because it couldn't take some sort of part time, you know, contribution. This was a really, you know, a full startup and a full thing uh, that needed to be fully dedicated to. So, um, right. yeah, I left Bankless with the intention of building pods in mind. And uh, yeah. Nice. Well, a lot of progress in, in less than a year. The site looks great. And uh, you guys have a lot of podcasts booted up. So so uh, all, all looks pretty good so far. Um, would be curious to hear, you know, you, you mentioned like early interests in crypto joining like the blockchain group or, or club in, in college. Um, how did you like help, help me understand how you sort of landed upon media as like that cross section where you really found things interesting versus like, you know, a lot of people, they get into crypto and they get obsessed with Bitcoin or, um, you know, there's, there's various different ways to like sort of plug in DeFi, whatever it might be. You took this interest in, in media in particular. Can you sort of trace why that was, like how that happened? Yeah, I think it's actually something that I never personally expected. But um, in 2018, you know, 2019, there weren't really many opportunities, you know, for non-technical people in the crypto industry. And media was kind of like the big thing of like, okay, you can start writing, you can start creating content, helping educate people it was really like the main area that people could scale their work. And, you know, through that, build a connection, you know, build a network, build connections, um, really make a name for themselves, build their brand. Um, so yeah, the reason I fell into media was really none other than like, this was the main opportunity to, you know, contribute to the space and like where I could find the most value in contributing to the space. Um, as a non-technical person at the time. Um, and obviously today, like there's so much more opportunities for, you know, BD, you know, growth people. There's so many roles for non-technical people now that it's a, a lot more 
um, mature. But I think at the time when I was getting involved, you know, with no experience, you know, I was right out of college, right? So I had no experience, I had no background. And media was just kind of like the one thing that I could probably contribute to and started finding the most value out of and uh, getting the most value in return. Um, so it was really just a, a forcing function and nothing else. <laughs> to yeah, be no. honest. It makes a lot of sense. And so did you start by mostly doing like writing or were you like curating other people's yeah. writing? Like how did you plug in into media? Yeah, so we were, uh, me and Cooper were both writing a lot, um, really covering the emergence of DeFi. Uh, so really helping people understand what Uniswap was, how to take out a loan on Maker, um, you know, uh, provide liquidity on Balancer, all sorts of uh, kind of tutorials and educational pieces. Um, and yeah, that was really where we found our kind of niche was being able to distill, you know, complex DeFi protocols into like very actionable insights and like guides for people to use them and leverage them. Um, and that was really like the main area that we found ourselves. And then also in addition to that, we were personally just very interested in the token game and still am, uh, where just analyzing different token protocols and understanding where value accrues and how to kind of invest and allocate capital into these things. Um, so that was kind of our newsletter token Tuesday, where we were really analyzing a lot of these DeFi coins and DeFi tokens at the time, trying to figure out, you know, who are the front runners, who are the, you know, best bets to place your money on, um, all sorts of stuff like that. So that's kind of where we really found our niche um, was kind of on the one explaining DeFi and two, how to invest in DeFi. Right. Uh, and then so you got discovered basically by uh, Ryan at Bankless and he brought you on on board there as like the first employee. I think you said there was like less than uh, 10,000 subscribers when you joined and obviously when you left, you know, hundreds of thousands. So pretty big, you know, growth there, like in, in a relatively short time that you spent there. Um, what was like your what, what did you learn? What was your sort of impression of being, you know, behind the scenes on, on a podcast that kind of blew up over your time there and, uh, you know, was doing things like you said, just, you know, web two way. Yeah. It was a web three focus in terms of the conversations and whatnot, but nothing, you know, untraditional in terms of like how they were doing things with sponsorships and whatnot. Do you like the podcasting industry as it is? Do you think there's pieces of it that are kind of broken, um, that are sort of begging for maybe some kind of, you know, crypto, uh, involvement outside of just the fact that it, it kind of makes sense with all other media going on chain that that podcast would do the same. Yeah. I think on the question around, do I like the podcasting industry or just the media business in general? I think like one of the biggest pet peeves for me was just like, um, advertisements and sponsors and like, you know, killing the content, uh, or like mitigate or not mitigating, but, um, being a detriment to the content consumption experience via mm -hmm. advertisement. So like, you know, yeah. middle of this podcast, Hey, quick break, we're going to cut to our sponsor Nexo, you know, yeah. that pisses me off. Right. Oh, Cause we, that we is just not, a, we, we won't have any not, of this in this episode. We won't have any of that yeah. sponsorships mid, mid roll or, or pre or post. Yeah. And I think just that concept, especially like, I think some people do it really well of like the Tim Ferriss is like really only shill, you know, stuff that he uses. Right? right. Like, and like genuinely backs, but I think like a lot of the industry, and this is not specific to bankless or anyone, it's really just like the industry as a whole web to within crypto. And then like, you know, more broadly, um, is people just kind of like shamelessly plug advertisements on who, who, who's willing to pay the biggest dollar. They don't really care if they're using it. They're not, you know, really, um, putting the value behind it that, or like their commitment that like, Hey, this is a phenomenal product that I use. And it's always more of like, Hey, these guys paid us to, to say this. And like, that's kind of the, the deal. And I think for me, that's just like not an optimal business model. There has to be something better. And that's kind of where I went down this rabbit hole of like, how do we monetize, um, you know, based on something about the content itself and just publishing the content on chain enables the content itself to be fully monetizable. And then the other side of it is like, okay, your, your alternative to sponsors is like paid subscriptions and gated content. And like, that is also not like super ideal because you're gating all the content, you're restricting the audience growth and size that can, and reach of that content. Um, so publishing on chain really provides this kind of happy medium, happy, happy balance of, I can release this work for free. 
of anyone can consume it. I can put it on YouTube. I can put it on Spotify. Anyone can consume it. We can maximize on that growth, but also not destroy like the, the consumption experience of like, we have to plug in advertisers, you know, um, or anything like that. The content can just be mintable for the people that really love it and that really want to own it or, and, uh, really want to support you as a creator. Right. Um, and those avenues, I think to me, it's just a much more organic, stronger monetization experience for both sides of the collector and the creator, right? Um, the creator doesn't have to worry about getting a sponsor or, you know, shilling anything like that or restricting their audience size via paid subscriptions. Um, and the collector gets to own the work, right? They can super like and support the creator directly for that content that they created just because they like it. And it doesn't have to be anything crazy, like hundreds of thousands of dollars. It can just be two bucks, five bucks, you know, anything like that. Um, just a small tip to support that creator. And in return, I actually get a copy of it and I get to prove that I was here and I've been a supporter and uh, maybe you'll notice it. And we can talk a little bit more about that social graph aspect that I think is really powerful. But um, yeah, I would say the business model today via web two is not optimal via subscriptions and advertisers. And I think minting provides a much better experience for everyone. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I think, um, you know, since I've been doing this for a few years now and, uh, in the beginning, you know, I, I didn't have the audience or anything to, to monetize. So it wasn't really a concern, but then once it start, started to become like, okay, you know, is, are there ways I can monetize this without sacrificing the the quality of what I'm doing or the authenticity or anything like that? Um, I think to your point, like the advertising, there are better and worse ways to do it. But, um, in general, like uh, my initial sort of inclination towards it was not like super positive. I, I ultimately ended up changing my mind for a while. And I was like, you know what? Uh, the sponsors, which I originally viewed as being kind of like selling out or something, um, I realized, you know, they actually don't really, like people don't actually perceive them that they, that way. They're like very normalized. And so as long as you're sort of, um, you know, promoting products that you genuinely use and love and would recommend regardless of sort of the sponsorship, it's like, it actually, it kind of looks like credibility to people on the outside. So I did do sponsors for a little while. Um, I had like the Aura Ring, which, you know, I was using for a couple of years already at that point. And I was, they were a sponsor and um, uh, a couple others basically of, you know, products that I used and, and genuinely loved and was recommending anyway. That's kind of what, how the Aura one started. I reached out, mm -hmm. I was like, look, I've been recommending this to friends for like two years now. And, uh, you know, I had the CEO on the podcast. So I was like, maybe we can just, you know, make this a, a real sponsorship and that's how that worked out. Um, but ultimately I, I don't have like a huge audience still. And so the, the numbers didn't really make sense. It wasn't really worth either sides while. So I sort of cut that off. And then on the other side of things, it's like with the, uh, you know, the, the subscribers, the paid subscribers, the premium tiers, stuff like that. It's like, I agree with you. I mean, and there's no like need for me or, or I have zero desire and actually like the opposite desire of like restricting my content to certain audiences or even giving some sort of like premium, like doing something extra for a piece of my audience or something like that. Like I kind of want to just do what I want to do and make the content that I want to make and have the conversations I want to have and just share it with anyone around the world with an internet access. Like that's, you know, the, the broadest reach possible and to make it free for everyone and everything like that. And so there's no like sort of obvious answer within that for how to monetize the thing. Uh, and even if you have no problems or no qualms with the sponsorships, um, it's still like very much a power law game, right? Where like only the top, you know, one or 2% or whatever of podcasts or media of any kind can really substantially monetize. Um, and so, you know, is there a way to do it where, you know, up and coming artists or up and coming podcasters, I, I mentioned artists because in music, you've seen some success here with like indie artists who are able to monetize far earlier than they would by like, you know, signing a record deal or something like that, just by getting some, some of their serious fans behind them and like sort of an on-chain media type of way. Um, so I, I like the way that you're sort of setting up the story and, and uh, you know, threading the needle there. And uh, I guess, you know, the best way to sort of introduce what you're doing might be kind of like from scratch, like how you've actually built this, got the podcast on board and some early sort of uh, signs of, of, you know, positivity from, from experiments being run on the platform. Yeah, I want to pull on a few threads and then we can talk about, you know, how we build pods. But I think the big thing that is really interesting is the day zero monetization that you get and like that 
minting is a permissionless monetization model for anyone, right? So you don't need to wait until you scale up an audience to 10,000, 100,000 people in order to make it attractive for a sponsor. You can just do it on day zero. You know, if you have one fan that really likes your work, you can start to monetize. And maybe it's not a lot, but like, think about the long tail of creators. Like we have a bunch of smaller podcasts on pods right now. Um, that are maybe earning, you know, 50, 100 bucks every episode. But like for the long tail, given that they have, you know, a couple hundred viewers, that's pretty meaningful, right? That becomes like a source of income for your side gig that wasn't producing anything because your audience wasn't large enough um, to either get a sponsor or get paid subscriptions or anything like that. So being able to monetize from day zero is super powerful for the long tail. And then through it, um, you know, when you only have a couple audience members that are listening in the early days, like you are also providing some sort of upside on you as a creator, um, via publishing on chain. So imagine, you know, Joe Rogan first episode, you know, only had a, you know, he had a decent audience, but 10,000 people may have minted it, you know, for the first episode. Now he's at millions, right? So those first 10,000 people that minted the episode, you know, probably have some upside upside in Joe Rogan's, you know, growth. Or if you find some creator on day zero, day one, you know, when they have 50 people listening to them and you're one of the big supporters, and then they go out and they scale to 50,000, 100,000, kind of go on that bankless level of growth. Um, you're probably going to see some upside because you owned a lot of that early work, right? right? So for the collector, this is actually really interesting to curate, you know, up and coming creators own their work and see if you get some sort of you know, upside as they scale up their audience. And, you know, a big key piece of that is continuing to, you know, engage the collector side, the on-chain piece. Like you can't just, you know, publish on-chain or have it, you know, uh, just kind of loosely there. But I think creators that really um, approach this from like, hey, I can go out, mint my content and build an audience and support that audience and reward that audience for being there and helping me out and supporting me. Um, you can really start to provide a really compelling experience for early audience members and listeners and, and, and viewers. Um, yeah. Let me, let me ask a, a question there, if you don't mind. Um, I think, you know, one, of, as you get into crypto, there's like various things, like there's still people out there, obviously, who are like, you know, Bitcoin, like it's worth nothing. You can't touch it, whatever. Like there's, you know, it takes time for people to wrap their heads around like various elements of crypto, like, and, and like maybe one step at a time. And, uh, one one sort of area that I still have a, a bit of a tough time sometimes like wrapping my head around is kind of what you're describing. And I'm, I'm curious to like talk about it a little bit, um, which is basically the idea that if you have, you know, in this case, uh, you know, on-chain media or, or an NFT of someone's podcast episode or something like that, and that person goes on to become more prominent, uh, you know, the assumption is that then that piece of content that you own as an nft will will there therefore also be like more valuable and that's like something that's you know assumed in you know in this case with podcast nfts it's sort of come to fruition with like generative art nfts and various artists becoming more notable and their works therefore like become more notable profile pictures stuff like that um you've also seen it sort of fail in some cases where for example like i thought big cloud uh, i'm sure you're like a little bit familiar with BitCloud, at least. Yeah. Yeah. So BitCloud, um, you know, was basically like a Twitter where you could kind of like invest in people's profiles. And it was like a similar thing, like in the early days, um, you know, you're trying to invest in someone's profile because you're early on BitCloud and not that many people are on BitCloud in total. So you assume that like the popular people on the platform, as more people get on the platform, that first, you know, that popular person who's already popular their profile is going to become like very valuable. And so you're early in it in that sense. But if you assume that the the platform like BitCloud is going to exist for like a decade or, you know, more, then it's less about that. It's more like, you know, a year or two into the platform's existence. You're not like early on the platform anymore, although you, you still probably would be, but you're more so looking for people who are like kind of early in their personal journeys. And if you can invest in their profile before they're successful and you can kind of assume that the platform will remain in existence for a long period of time, then as that person gets more prominent, their profile should also like become more valuable. Um, and in that case, you know, the reason I say like it kind of failed is because like BitCloud as a platform, I'm not gonna say it failed. I know it's still out there and they're, they're still doing stuff, but there's been a couple of these platforms that have come about that have, you know, surged and, and gone super popular for a little bit and then kind of like died out and have yet to sort of like 
recapture their peak. And and I, I hesitate to rule any of these things out because Bitcoin itself, you know, had like many peaks and valleys over the course of its early several years. But um, it, it sort of hinges upon the existence of the platform. Um, and so I'm curious, like how you think about this kind of assumption that is widely held within crypto that just by finding someone early or finding something early and as that person gets more prominent there will be more value accrued to the the product of their creation even if like it's not like you're making you know dividends off the product or something like that like there's no real income stream it's just like a perceived value how do you think about all that yeah i would say the first caveat is like I don't expect it to be one to one, right? Like in the sense of I increase my audience by, you know, a hundred X and then my, the value of the NFTs are going to increase by a hundred X. Like, I just don't think that that is the right model to approach. Right. Um, but I think like generally if on day zero, I have a hundred listeners and 10 collectors. And then on day a hundred, I have 10,000 listeners and a thousand, uh, collectors, like your uh, collector base increase by, you know, a hundred X or something like that. Um, and that should in some way be seen, you know, uh, in terms of value for the earlier collectors in some capacity. Mm -hmm. Now, I think to your point on the platform risk, that's really interesting. Cause like, I think for BitCloud and even friend tech, like these are, you are entirely reliant on the platform to continue to succeed, to bring in new users, et cetera. I think we're on-chain media is a little bit different and this goes and this is true for zora or for pods or anything like that is that the media itself is on chain and you don't necessarily need the platform to succeed you really just need your media to be available to mint because i can publish on zora and then maybe i come across it on farcaster and mint it there um that's not necessarily reliant on zora or that's less reliant on zora as a platform than it is like friend tech, right? right. In some capacity. Um, and I think the fact that the, the media is on chain, right? And the user actually owns that media. This is just Ethereum contracts that they own. Um, you kind of get a little bit more self-sovereignty around uh, against uh, like versus the platform itself. Like whereas friend tech, everyone is interacting with a friend tech profile via um, you know, that friend tech application or same thing with big clout. Um, when you're interacting with a piece of media, it might be from Zora, it might be from pods, it might be from manifold, and you might be interacting it on Farcast, or you might be interacting it with, uh, via interface or surreal or any sort of applications, maybe a Farcast or podcast client. Um, there's so many other endpoints to be interacting with that piece of media and to be able to mint it, um, that really the through line is for us, is like, just get the media on chain. Um, and you know, for pods, like, I think that there's a very clear future where 90% of the mints aren't actually happening on the pods platform. Um, but we're just providing the publishing experience to get it on chain. And the, a lot of the mints are happening on other platforms, right? So that composability of the media being available on other platforms and kind of just the nature of media as a whole, and the sense of like, you want to maximize the distribution of it, I think really de-risk a lot of the the platform side of things that you were talking about, which is just a little bit different from BitCloud or, or friend tech, but I would say it's not like a non-zero or not a zero, like it's not zero, the fact, right. like the factor, right? But it's definitely a lot less, I think, in my opinion, just because you kind of get this fully composable piece of media that is going to be consumed on multiple platforms and no one really cares what the publisher is, right? Yeah. Um, that's kind of my take. Yeah. And how, how do you think it compares? Like, you're going to be more familiar than I am with uh, like music NFTs and like the various mm -hmm. platforms there. I guess one question would be, you know, um, say you know some podcaster goes on pods.media starts minting you know putting their podcast on chain um and you know five years from now i'm not saying this is expected reality but just as a hypothetical pods.media let's say doesn't exist anymore and there's some like massive player that came in and actually you know like succeeded in in probably the the roadmap that you guys are pursuing but it ends up for whatever reason not being you guys that podcaster who started putting their podcast on chain via pods media basically i think what you're saying is like the unlike friend tech or BitClout, where their profile if the platform kind of fails their their profile generally kind of fails 
in this case, the fact that they started minting their podcasts on chain years ago, regardless of what platform they were using to do that, um, the sort of value proposition can still sort of maintain longer term, regardless of what platform they end up using in the future. Is that, is that, that sounds kind of right. And then, so, yes. um, and the reason, and the reason yeah, for that is because they own the contracts that their, their content content is hosted on. And that's just right. an Ethereum contract that, you know, this, you know, new platform pods two or whatever you want to call it, um, can go ahead and just be like, Oh, wow. Like, you know, pods had a lot of the, uh, podcasts on chain, but we're providing a better experience, you know, we'll go ahead and just index, uh, or be able to migrate, you know, your pods 1155 contract to, um, you know, the new platform. Right. right. And that is owned hundred percent by the creator, you know, whether we exist tomorrow, if we go dead tomorrow, like all the content still exists, it's on our weave, it's owned. The contracts are owned by the respective podcast. Um, and they can go and use that and plug that in wherever they could go and spin up a new tool, um, that, you know, publishes to that contract, all sorts of stuff. Right. So you kind of get a little bit more uh, defensibility and, you know, uh, less platform risk, uh, right. when the contracts itself are, are owned by this respective creator. Right. And there's still going to be like protocol risk basically, which exists in these, these platforms as well. But, um, that's like sort of a layer deeper where, you know, it's, it's more reasonable to believe that, you know, Ethereum is going to exist in five or 10 years than, you know, uh, friend tech or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, you know, there's risk in any case, but once I think that's been kind of the interesting thing about crypto, like if people have kind of built the infrastructure over these first, you know, decade plus or whatever, or, you know, less so for, for Ethereum, it sort of takes time regard, even if the infrastructure is fully there to do a lot of cool and interesting things, you really need to be able to like rest assured that the thing is still going to be there in like five or 10 years in order to comfortably build interesting things on it. Because even if your thing is really interesting and great, if the protocol doesn't exist, like it all fails. Um, and so it's sort of, you, you need to kind of I think the industry has, you know, in terms of like consumer apps and stuff like that, there's been a requirement for patience to see because you just can't, the, the earlier you bet on a, a brand new protocol existing for 10 years, that that's like kind of an out of the money bet when the protocol is yeah. six months old. But when it's five years old, you can more realistically predict that it'll be around in five or 10 more years. 100%. And uh, yeah, I think that that part is really interesting. And then what's what's really interesting and like i kind of mentioned this already is that like all of these contracts right you get to own your own self-sovereign contract and you can kind of take that wherever you want whereas like you know you on youtube publishing this video on youtube like you don't actually own that work um if youtube decides to deplatform it or uh you know just take it off the website or decides to shut down tomorrow like you lose all of that content Whereas, you know, in some respect on Ethereum by publishing on chain, you get to own that con all that content a hundred percent. Like we, even as pods don't have control over any of the podcast feeds that are being created, um, on pods. So the, the explicitly have to add us as like an admin or something like that to the contract in order for us to have any control over it. Um, so even if we just deleted ourselves tomorrow, like all of the contract, all of the content still exists. And it just takes someone to kind of re-architect or put the pieces back together. Um, but all the pieces are there, right? Which is, I think, the most important part. Right. Yeah. So one of the interesting things you guys are doing, uh, in addition to allowing podcasters to put their content on chain, um, is you've basically, if you're a collector on pods.media, you're, you're minting your favorite episodes of your favorite podcasts that are on chain, um, you can then go and, you know, so, so say I'm on there, right. As like a collector, um, my buddy can go to pods.media connect with their crypto wallet and, um, they can go and see my collection, but not only can they see my collection, they can actually follow, uh, my, every podcast episode that I mint sort of uh, basically a curation of the podcast that I've minted, um, as like a feed on you know, not just on pods.media, they don't have to all of a sudden go listen to all their podcasts on pods.media or something like that. They can take that curated feed that I'm creating through minting. It's not just like I'm like adding to a playlist, like I'm actually minting and spending a little bit of money or at least gas fees or whatever to go and mint these podcast episodes that I like. They can go and follow basically my curation on 
Apple or Spotify or whatever it is through this like custom created channel that you guys have enabled. So um, I guess, you know, the more specific question is like, why was that like an early feature that you guys thought was interesting? And more broadly, what's your guys strategy, like step one, get people to, you know, enable people to, to put their podcasts on chain, maybe step two or, or feature one or whatever, like allow people to have these curated feeds that people can follow. Um, what's like the overall thinking behind the strategy? Yeah, so I think step one, Okay, so tying back to the last question of like how we built this. Um, so the pods contracts are effectively a fork of the Zora 1155. Um, so the reason behind this is like when we were testing this at Bankless, we were using 721s um, with the frequency that you release content, you, uh, you know, via a podcast, you're releasing, you know, let's say a podcast a week. By the end of the year, you're going to have 52 separate uh, 721 contracts because every episode is its own separate contract. Um, so one of the things that we did was put these under 1155s, um, where the creator has one contract and all of the episodes show up as a token under that contract. So it really kind of streamlines the thinking or the, uh, the management side of things, um, by using the 1155s. Um, now with that, that was kind of step one is like, okay, we can't do this with 721s. What's the best NFT architecture to for content as a whole? And we found that these 1155s are the best because it effectively acts as a channel, right? I spin up a creator contract, an 1155 contract. That's effectively my pod of Jake channel. Um, and then all of the episodes, all of the content is going to live under that single contract. Um, so we're boiling down, you know, I don't know how many episodes you're in, probably a couple hundreds. Uh, so we're boiling down you know, hundreds of contracts down to one single contract in perpetuity. Um, so that was a big step. And then the second piece, step two there was, uh, how do we mimic um, the 1155 contract and the, the metadata of it to mimic an RSS feed? Um, because for podcasting, an RSS feed is the protocol. It's like an open protocol responsible for syndicating content across the web. And this is what Spotify and Apple and all of these, you know, podcast players platforms use. Um, to kind of catch and aggregate all of the content that's coming to them is via an RSS. Um, so one of the first features that you're talking about was, okay, how do we build these 1155 contracts in with the same uh, respect to an RSS feed? Um, so can we match all the metadata, all that kind of stuff? And we got to that point. So we were able to generate uh, effectively what's currently a private RSS feed for every podcast on pods. Um, and this is effectively taking all of their 1155 contract data and all the token ID contract data um, and syndicating it as an RSS feed. Um, so that's where that came from. And then we realized uh, kind of just through that, that like, okay, we're just aggregating every episode on pods, every piece of content on pods is mimicking this RSS feed data architecture. Um, and we realized like, okay, like a profile, someone's collection has all this exact same data. And we can actually just generate a private RSS feed um, based on a collector's collection, right? Um, so that kind of creates this new mechanism that we hadn't really um, seen before where it allows like someone to curate their own RSS feed um, and personalize their own like private feed so that other people can listen to it, um, you know, via their normal player. Um, so that's actually a big piece of it is like by doing this, um, the 1155 contracts, all the on-chain data can seamlessly plug into every other podcast player outside of a couple of them, like Spotify is one of them because they're gated and they're closed. Um, but Apple Podcasts, you know, Google Podcasts, now YouTube Music, most podcast players support this where you can just paste the link that's an RSS feed and now it imports all the, all the episode content. So by creating this architecture, we were just really easily able to plug into the web two side of stuff, um, which I think was kind of a, a unique and novel like mechanism for us um, to bridge this gap between web three media and web two media. Um, and I kind of lost my train of thought there and where we wanted to go here. But um, I think the through line was for these RSS feed features, um, we were really just trying to one mimic uh, what web two media was using. Uh, for syndication, and then to matching it to Ethereum contract data. And through that, we actually had a lot of opportunities. Like one was the podcast feed and the second one was these collector feeds. So we could enable collectors to, when they mint on chain, it kind of adds it to their collection. And then we're generating an RSS feed from their collection. So 
Um, it really enables this unique experience where, you know, someone that's a podcast listener can really curate their own episodes, share it with their friends, be like, Hey, yo, follow my feed. Um, you know, anytime I'm into an episode, you'll get a notification from Apple podcasts saying that there's a new episode here that you can listen to. You know, I put two to three bucks behind this and, you know, I think it's a great episode. Um, so go and listen to it. And, uh, that kind of a uh, social experience, I think is something unique that we haven't been able to see. Um, and yeah, it was kind of just like a random bonus idea that kind of came out of us just, uh, building the podcast feeds, the RSS feeds is that we realized that you know, collector profiles or collector collections have the same kind of architecture and we could just generate um, something from that. Uh, so that's kind of where that came from, which is kind of a blind luck on that. Yeah, no, nice. I I, uh, I think it's an interesting feature, like in, even independent of any crypto elements, um, right. the concept of being able to follow what someone else is following in a sense. In this case, they're also, you know, minting. But again, if you even remove the crypto, element um i know there's like you know curation is like very important curation of information like you know creating your own information diet these days and i think some of the smartest people in the world like one of the most valuable things they have to offer is basically their own information diet and so if you can sort of like take someone who you really respect and admire and have learned a lot from and you find yourself wondering like hmm you know like i wonder who they follow on twitter and uh you know what blogs they read and what podcasts they listen to independent yep. of anything crypto related it would be super interesting to be able to tap into uh you know i like follow that person's twitter feed follow that person's um you know blogs that they read uh and follow their their podcasts that they that they listen to um again independent of anything crypto related and obviously you're not just going to necessarily like follow one person's feeds and, and everything like that but you can sort of develop your own information diet through the combination of a few different people's curations. And obviously you'll have your own curation as well. And people can become basically, you know, prominent without having to even create any media just by being like excellent curators of media. And it almost adds a value to an otherwise pretty valueless, like consumption habit, uh, where if you're actually like a, a super, um, you know, interesting consumer and like you, you, you're able to identify great content, uh, better than anyone else in the world. Like you're, you're not creating any of that content, but you're still a very interesting person to follow. And that opportunity doesn't really exist in a lot of different formats today, other than like, you know, I might follow your blog on which you mentioned a lot of the content that you're consuming that week or something like that. But I think as a like infrastructural piece, being able to follow someone else's podcast curation is, is really interesting. Um, so move, you know, switching gears a little bit as, as we're coming up on time. Um, I know you guys have some plans for an upcoming launch. Uh, you guys are going to, uh, sort of get, get base involved, which has been a very popular, um, L2, uh, especially on Farcaster, which is how we got to, uh, you know, interacting a bit. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, what's going on between you guys and, and base and how you guys are also integrating with Farcaster a bit. Uh, and just taking advantage of these, uh, you know, far, both Farcaster and Base, which are doing quite well over the last year plus. Yeah. So if you're listening to this episode, um, it should be available on Base on Pods um, at the time of release. Uh, so we're very excited to integrate Base. Um, you know, when we were launching Pods in like our private beta, or just like starting to deploy a lot of the tooling, Base was just announced. Um, so we didn't really have you know, a lot of conviction around, you know, what this is going to be like, or like anything like that, you know, there was a part of it, you know, where it could have ended up like the Coinbase NFT marketplace that just ended up flopping. Right. Um, but obviously Jesse Pollock and that team have been doing an exceptional, exceptional job of, you know, fostering growth in the network. And a lot of the momentum right now is around there. Um, so we deployed natively on OP mainnet, um, but starting, uh, Next week, at the time of recording, uh, we are going to be supporting base um, and really opening up uh, a lot of the consumer people that are, are minting and, and being active on chain um, to pods. So we're really excited about that. This will be one of the first episodes available on base. Um, and with it, uh, Farcaster has also kind of just seen a lot of this, you know, parabolic growth and a lot of solid momentum. And uh, we've seen a lot of a uh, a lot of our growth come from the Farcaster ecosystem, especially with the launch of frames that make it really easy for people to see the episode and collect it there. 
um, directly, you know, in Warpcast without ever leaving, you know, that experience or that application. Um, so the combination of both base with Farcaster, I think, has been a silver bullet, I guess, for a lot of these early applications, consumer facing applications, as there's just a lot of activity there um, around both of these things. And they're pro both providing a lot of uh, helpful infrastructure to make it easy to mint, um, whether it is via frames, whether it is like Coinbase embedded wallets, all that kind of stuff uh, is really making it a lot easier for the average user to get on chain. Um, so tapping into both of these growth mechanisms has been uh, really powerful for pods. Um, and we're really excited to see uh, base come into fruition um, as of right now, when you're listening to this and uh, see where it goes from here. I think uh, Jesse Pollock and that whole team have just done, again, an amazing job at, at fostering growth. And uh, yeah, a lot of our creators have wanted base over the past few months, as especially as we've seen more and more on-chain activity happen there. Um, so it just felt natural to support base and uh, make sure that we're building what creators want. And if they want to deploy on base and publish their content on base, then so be it. Awesome. Well, uh, very excited to see where all this goes and, and appreciate you taking the time to talk through some of it today. Um, what's the best way for people to go and, and get involved with pods, you know, after listening to this episode and follow along with, uh, with you and, and pods sort of journey, you know, here on out. Yeah, I think the first step will be you'll be able to mint this episode on pods. I'm assuming the URL hasn't been created yet, but it's going to be like podstopmedia forward slash pod of Jake. Um, you'll be able to collect this episode there. And uh, yeah, we have about 30 episodes or 30 podcasts on chain, probably 35 by the time you listen to this um, with over 250 episodes on chain right now. So we're building a pretty deep archive of on chain episodes that you can go and mint and own and listen. And, um, as we talked about curate your own personal RSS feed with your favorite episodes. Um, so yeah, that's the best place to go. Check us out on pods.media as the website, or you can follow us at pods on Warpcast. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks again, Lucas. Awesome conversation and, uh, looking forward to seeing how all this goes. Amazing. Jake, thank you so much for the time. Thank you.